Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this morning's um, webinar. My name is Ike EJ. I'm the architecture critic for Building Magazine, and I shall be the chair of the webinar. Um, the theme for this morning's webinar is um, an overview of Build Earth Live's Hyperloop. And um, today's webinar will look at the latest in the series of a, of a series of collaborative BIM competitions where six teams were asked to design a prototype for a Hyperloop um, um, high-speed train that can reduce travel time between Dubai and Fujaria to 10 minutes. And just to give you a bit of context, that's a distance of around 70 miles, say London to Swindon, and the journey time currently by public transport can take up to two hours. So um, 10 minutes is an extremely advanced production on that. Um, each design had to lay plans for parallel Hyperloop transportation, um, one for passengers and another for cargo, and with both forms of tra transportation eventually converging. The designs also had to include full uh, mock-ups for stations with spacious concour concourses and halls and areas for passengers to board the trains. So today we'll be hearing from a variety of speakers. Um, there'll be judges as well as a representative um, of the winning team, which is Mobius, and they will describe the competition and what made the winning formula in this event, as well as how the use of BIM and cloud-based working was integral to their individual project success. Right, um, it won't just be me speaking today. Obviously, as I said before, we have four speakers um, who will be taking us through their individual approach to the um, Hyperloop um, competition. First of all, we shall hear from from Nathan. Um, Nathan Doughty, he's the Chief Operating Officer of Eyesight, and Eyesight to the founders of Build Earth Live as well. Um, I'll just quickly run through who else we'll hear for after, um, after Nathan as well. After Nathan, there's going to be four speakers. We shall then hear from Paul BT, BT Powell, who's, Powell, who is a judge from Build Earth Live um, with Hyperleap as well. We'll then hear from Paola Arigliano, who's a team member of Mobius, who are the winners of the Hyperloop competition. And then last but not least, we'll hear from Martin Horn, who's from Team BIM Unlimited, and they were the runners up in the Hyperloop competition. But there'll be no hard feelings here, just lots and lots of interesting information about the advanced technologies used in this competition. Right, um, without further ado, we shall move on. Ah, before we do, um, I'd just like to say, could um, throughout the um, presentation, please feel free to present any questions through, and there should hopefully be a session at the end whereby any of the, qu well, not all, any, some of the questions that you've been able to send through will be able to pitch directly to the speaker. So there will be an opportunity for some of your questions to be resolved. Also, finally, just a bit of housekeeping. The slides from this webinar will be available on demand through the building website um, from Monday. So they'll be available for Monday, so you can wait with bated breath over the weekend and catch up in it all on Monday when they're available. Right, enough from me. As I said, we shall first hear from Nathan, who will introduce us to um, 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 his firm's approach to the whole Hyperloop competition. Right, thank you very much, Nathan. Over to you. Thank you, Ike. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Ike said, my name is Nathan Doughty. I'm the uh, COO at Asight. Um, Asight, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a cloud-based collaboration company. We've been working with the um, global construction and engineering industry for the last 16 years, based out of London. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, the latest in a series of webinars that we've that we've conducted with Building Magazine about collaborative working, um, and this is about our, our most recent. Uh, global Collaborative Design Competition, Build Earth Live Hyperloop. Build Earth Live Hyperloop was, was run out of uh, the UAE, as, as I said, and focused on the um, design and, and um, virtual construction of a uh, hyperloop system between Dubai and the Emirate of Fujaira, uh, which happened to be across a mountain range from Dubai. It was uh, the the competition itself, the 48 hours of the competition was held at the end of September, the 26th to the 28th of September, uh, followed by a protracted judging session and awards ceremony and gala on the uh, day of October 4th um, in, in, um, in Dubai, uh, the city of the future. So, <clears throat> moving on. So, a little bit of background about this competition. Uh, Build Earth Live uh, is the latest, the eighth edition in a series of events, um, as as I said, uh, uh, that were founded 
by a site, but not just by a site, um, by a group of like-minded uh, companies and individuals from uh, from our industry who've all, who've been focused over the last two decades really on proving the case for interoperability uh, and collaborative working between parties and, and design teams in our industry, but also between systems. So the kind of fundamental proof of, of these events, uh, which are which which started out and continue to be and and will continue to be totally free to participate in. The fundamental proof of these events um, is to show that we can, as an industry, work together, even in compressed um, and accelerated time frames with a lot of pressure going on. We can work together, uh, regardless of our technology platforms, effectively and collaborate and produce impressive and significant results uh, with, 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 within, um, within 48 hours. So the way it works is that uh, we have a design challenge. Um, in this case, uh, the design challenge or the brief uh, was to uh, build a Hyperloop infrastructure between Dubai, Dubai and, and Fujairah City. For those of you who don't know what Hyperloop is, um, check out our website, buildearthlive.com. The Hyperloop concept was floated um, as a design idea by an individual called Elon Musk a number of years ago. Elon Musk um, is, is probably better known as uh, the founder of Tesla Motors, um, PayPal, and, and is considered a bit of a futurist globally. Uh, and the idea of the Hyperloop is that a, a um, high-speed capsules or um, train cars, if you want to think of them that way, can be accelerated through a tube um, at extremely high speeds using vacuum technology. So effectively, if you imagine a, um, a car or a group of a, a series of cars shooting through a tube, which is a vacuum, they're not touching any of the um, sides or bottom or top of the tube. Uh, they're floating in air and are pr uh, propelled using magnets um, outside. Um, from well, well, from outside. There's a lot of design challenges, but the basic ideas of it are um, are, are in place. And <clears throat> there are a number of initiatives globally, uh, not least Build Earth Live Hyperloop, to work with industry and, in our case, to work with the government of Dubai and the UAE to actually prove that this can work and build and implement it. It has the potential to revolutionize transport, uh, particularly um, near-term domestic uh, transport you know, between major cities. Uh, if you imagine the difference between uh, taking an airplane from uh, central London, i.e. going to Heathrow and then flying to Manchester to, to the airport and then getting to your meeting in central Manchester. Um, instead, if you could get into a uh, Hyperloop train uh, in the center of London and be in Manchester in, say, 25, 30 minutes, uh, Walking out of your uh, of your Hyperloop train in the central in central Manchester, you're effectively changing the way that we could work uh, and live in our in our built environment, and um, making distances which were previously not commutable um, ultimately commutable. One of the big one of the big um, talking points is the the ability to get from Los Angeles to San Francisco uh, within half an hour, for example. Uh, think about what that could do to the um, domestic air industry uh, in in, the, in that region. Okay, so the competition um, uh, is 48 hours. The design brief is released at, the, at, at noon on a Monday, um, and uh, all, all the teams from around the world uh, who, you know, throughout the eight editions that we've run have um, continued to surprise us each time um, with, the, you know, the, the, the willingness and, and enthusiasm of, of all of these um, design professionals, and, and, and it runs the gamut of professionals from architects, engineers, designers, um, construction and uh, con construction experts, project managers, um, urban planners, uh, you know, you name it, every uh, stripe of our industry is represented in these. Um, and they effectively commit to doing a, a 48 hour extended charrette during which uh, very little sleep is had uh, lots of caffeine is um, ingested, and huge amounts of technology are used to effectively try and design a solution and publish it to the world um, you know, within 48 hours. So as the 48 hours progress, 
um, you know, uh, the, the work products that are being produced, which includes not just designs and models, but also specs and, and construction analyses and thermal analyses and environmental analyses and, and everything that you can think of. All of that work product and output um, is published into the, the um, online collaborative platform, uh, which is ASITE, the Dottle platform. Uh, the teams are judged uh, not just on the on the on the the content that they produce, but also on their collaborative working approaches. You know, some of the teams do things like provide live you know uh, live feeds, effectively reality TV of their entire operation. So then they may have par partially co-located teams and and partially global, um, and, and you can watch them on YouTube throughout the 48 hours, which um, <laughs> sometimes is exciting and sometimes can be a bit boring as 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 a reality TV. Um, you know, is 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 what it is. But the 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 whole purpose is to showcase that we can do things quickly together. So the brief here, as we said, was was not not just for um, a hyperloop system, but for the uh, the termini or the stations at e, at um, either end. And in, in our case, what we set out as a challenge was to connect um, three termini which were the central one being Dubai Airport um, and the two end ones being Fujairah Airport, which is the other side of a mountain range, and the other end being Al Maktoum uh, Airport, which is a newer, new airport also in Dubai, south of, uh, south of the city, which is connected to the, to the um, Dubai shipping, main shipping ports. Um, and and the, the idea being that the Hyperloop would carry not only passenger traffic, but also would be um, uh, you know, a carrier of freight traffic and, and connect it off, you know, off of shipping containers being removed from, from, um, from the shipping industry and moved throughout the UAE. Um, so we, we proposed two parallel Hyperloop systems, um, one for the two-way passenger traffic and the second for freight. Okay, um, so the, the challenge was um, really geared around you know, a number of things. Um, one route or pathway finding. And how do you, you know, where do you put this hyperloop? Um, the, uh, where do you put this hyperloop uh, track? Um, the the sites themselves for the three uh, station termini were predefined as part of the brief. Um, we 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 provided detailed IFC uh, site context models for each of the three spots. Uh, but the um, uh, beyond the design constraints. The actual design of the of the three station and termini, um, as well as the tube and, and capsule mechanisms, were left to uh, to the teams. So, um, you know, as, as as part of the part of the idea of the event, um, you know, we have you know some, we're going to hear from a, num a few of our um, participants today, um, Paula from um, Team Mobius and Sistra, um, as well as Martin Horn from Dem Unlimited, and the um, uh, and, and, and that team. So part of what we do uh, for the event for the, with these teams is we promote it globally. Uh, obviously, as a digital event, uh, we, we make significant use of social media. Uh, but in this case, um, and, and kind of one of the benefits of working closely with the um, Dubai Future Foundation um, and the um, Dubai Road and Transit Authority, um, who were our, um, our, sp our, sp our sponsors for the event, uh, along with Vectorworks and Hyperloop One, um, we were able to generate a lot of traditional media coverage um, and, and interest uh, with you know, a number of, of spots, uh, both during as well as after the event and, and the award ceremony on television, including a number of stations around the UAE and Dubai. CNN picked it up. The Hyperloop concept um, is... Um, is of a lot of interest, uh, you know, as, as I said before, it, with its potential to, to revolutionize transport and, and significant coverage across our, our own industry, trade magazines, um, i.e. AEC and engineering. So we had over, um, over, over 4,500 individual observers um, during the 48-hour event on the Adato platform. What that means is people could log in or, or you know, register uh, for free and um, get, a, get a login and log in and, and basically check out and see um, all of the content that was being produced. So they could actually go in and in real time as, as, as models were being produced and view and interact with them. So um, 
as I, I said at the beginning, we had six teams, which is which is not quite correct. We had six, um, we had uh, actually seven finalists, um, and uh, that, those were only the, the the final teams, which made it through to the kind of last piece. Uh, during the overall um, uh, 48 hours of the event, we actually had 65 teams who who signed up, uh, which was by far the most teams that we've ever had in any, any of our Build Our Live events. And this Build Our Live event, you know, being being heavily focused on engine, engineering and Hyperloop, was a little different from our, all of our previous ones, which were more focused on more traditional AEC vertical uh, vertical build type um, type of projects. Like the last one we did in New York before this, for example, was focused on the Hudson Yards project, uh, which is you know a very urban uh, vertical vertical focused AEC project. Um, this is an infrastructure project uh, with stations in between. So we had a, we had a we had, a, we had a, a number of new players involved this time, but 65 teams, uh, over 1,250 um, individual participants across those teams, representing 29 countries. So as you can see here from the from the map on your screen, uh, showing showing all the countries who were represented, uh, we, we we had some we had uh, involvement from every continent on the planet. Um, so, so you know that's a significant, significant result. Considering again, as I said, that all of these professionals and practitioners are um, dedicating their time gratis um, for um, you know for kind of the joy, the joy of design and the joy of interoperability. At least that's what I like to think. So, um, throughout throughout the event, um, these participants as well as the observers were able to. Um, uh, log in and, and and see through dashboards and um, and real time updates, uh, you know content being produced, models being produced, um, as well as collabor collaboration back and forth. So um, teams raising um, teams raising RFIs amongst themselves um, or uh, design queries or raising queries to the um, organizers and the judging panel about the brief, for example. All of this was you know shared um, kind of like a you know if you imagine a public procurement process. Um, kind of like that, uh, in the sense that you know every every time that someone one team raised a query, it was visible to all the other teams. For example, so um, you know over 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 half over five thousand um, you know individual accesses to to workspaces. Obviously, we had a range of different types of teams, as we always do. Um, some of the um, more well organized um, and bigger teams, um, you know, you would see obviously a correspondingly greater. Uh, collaborative output, um, and then a lot of um, a lot of smaller teams as well. I mean, across 65 teams, you know, you're going to expect to have um, uh, you know a range, and some of those teams, even down to one-man band teams, uh, which you know, in, in past events we've had one-man band teams who've who've um, done very well actually. Um, it's it's um, <clears throat> you know obviously it's a lot easier to collaborate when you're only collaborating with yourself. Um, <laughs> so that's taken into consideration uh, in the judging, but but um, but but the the bigger, more um, more, more well organized teams will have, um, as you would expect, a um, a well defined um, role definition at the beginning. So you know all, all of the trades represented, uh, a dedicated project manager or or you know BIM information manager um, who is. Keeping track of everybody and making sure that there's a program or schedule and that's being kept to. As always, we, um, we we track you know what's the the pattern of content being produced throughout the event, um, and we we you know typically uh, we see what we see here in this graph at the at the bottom of which is logins, but the same applies to to um, content being uploaded. You see a, a burst at the beginning, and then you see uh, a kind of you know slow down. You obviously get sleep in there. A little bit, although we don't know how much they actually sleep. Um, and then towards the, the very end, you get panic uploading as the the 12 noon on Wednesday deadline um, approaches, and everybody has to have the content in to be ready for the judging. They are all, you know, manically up, getting in there, getting everything loaded up. Human nature, <laughs> and also the nature of you know having to produce it all in 48 hours. So um, over 10,000 files um, and artifacts published in, and, and over 266 uh, BIM models uh, or models loaded into uh, to the Adotal CBIM platform. Um, lots of lots of versioning and a huge amount of um, you know individual you know almost four million individual accesses and audit records or comments and discussions. Okay, and um, you know teams as I said before using our using smart forms or in, intelligent forms 
um, rather than email to collaborate. Although that being said, you know, again, one of the big um, one of the big uh, characteristics of, of this type of collaborative behavior is and has been the use of a very wide range of technologies, um, which is kind of the essence of of, um, of collaboration in, in, in you know, using a common data environment like a Doddle, um, which is that you know it doesn't matter what output or technologies you use, you know it all gets federated into one centralized um, and and audited repository. Okay, so we would see um, a number of different models across a variety of disciplines um, uh, being organized in, in you know different ways because you know each team would have their own uh, BIM execution protocols. Um, you know, well, albeit some teams may not have been sophisticated enough to have a BEP, but many, most of those that did would organize um, either in disciplines. But we did have you know we have a number of different approaches. Um, and um, you know, and a significant amount of as you can see, I don't know if you can see here on the on the left, the um, the, the split up. Uh, this is um, this is team, team Hyper Poland, which was one of the one of the finalist teams, um, and splitting up their um, federated IFC model um, by the three different site contexts, i.e., Al Maktoum, Dubai, and Fujaira, um, and then within that by discipline. Um, and again, so we're going to hear from a couple of the teams today, um, as well as one of our um, distinguished judges. Paul B.T. Pownell, who's a uh, leading architect in the uh, London area. Um, these are a list of some of the most active teams um, who um, were, you know, all of which were, were commendable and had uh, amazing results, um, out of which um, the six finalists were chosen um, and uh, out of which our, our winners um, and various runners-up um, were, um, were, were chosen. But these, but these guys you can see here, um, you know, across across Europe, the North America, uh, India, you know, the Middle East, Iran, the UAE. Um, future architects there is a um, uh, doesn't say on there, but they're from Cairo, Egypt. Um, they're a student-based team. Um, um, sorry, apologies. Future architects is from the UAE um, and Hypernova. Uh, they're also a, a, a student-based team. The Hypernova team at the bottom is from Egypt. So we had two really distinguished and really um, amazing teams fully comprised of undergraduate students um, who obviously have not yet qualified um, but were but were, um, were, were very enthusiastic, both of whom uh, came to Dubai. Um, so the six finalist teams, seven, sorry, seven finalist teams that we had, including these two um, student teams, Hypernova and Future Architects, um, they were all invited to Dubai um, for what was, a, what was um, you know, a little bit of a reward, I suppose, although there was work to be done as well. Um, the reward was we we, um, we we got them to to come to Dubai for the final judging and award ceremony, um, and they got to have a bit of fun. We went up to the top of the um, Burj Khalifa, uh, for example, and had a nice meal. Um, and then on the day of the um, award ceremony, um, uh, His Excellency, um, who the CEO of Dubai Future Foundation, joined us um, along for a full day of presentations from the from the finalist teams and for the awards giving, uh, which was which was a really a, a, you know, an occasion to behold. So uh, overall, um, you know, a very successful event from our perspective. Um, we, we're going to hear a bit more about the detail of it, uh, but we're very excited. Um, there's, if you check out buildearthlive.com, um, there's an amazing video that, we, that was produced um, highlighting uh, the winning designs and, and showing some of the um, uh, some of the, the scenes from the award ceremony itself and, and, and the winning teams. Please check it out. And uh, that's it for me, Ike. Great. Thank you very much, Nathan. Um, that was excellent. Thank you. Um, just to remind um, um, our listeners, um, please feel free to send through any questions as the speakers are talking. And as I said, we'll try and present them to the team afterwards. Right. As Nathan um, suggested, we're now going to hear from one of the judges. We're going to hear from Paul B.T. Pownall, who is a director of BPR Architects, and he was one of the judges for Build Live um, Earth and the Hyperloop project as well. So he'll be able to provide a very interesting perspective on the assessment criteria. All right, Paul, um, over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ike. Um, we had an amazing time in Dubai reviewing the finalists, and we were looking for four key um, directions. One was um, clearly a very strong vision as to where they saw the Hyperloop um, and how they could see that work for the future. But also, from a BIM perspective, it was all about collaboration. And we were trying to 
understand how effectively the design teams had communicated across the world, across international boundaries, by using the current technology. And, and some, if they were smart, were also using the timeline so that you could work through the 48-hour period, um, but generally in the daytime. So it's an amazing, amazing story there. Uh, we were also looking for um, the use of 4D tools to see if people had thought through how you could actually deliver such an amazing project um, in, in real time. And the final criteria was about innovation. We were really looking for new ideas, innovation both in how we um, develop the design and use technology for design, but also in innovation in how you really need to think about Hyperloop and how it might um, generate a new idea for transportation. And it provoked amongst the judges particularly, but whilst we were reviewing the schemes, amazing discussion, um, just, just thinking about what the Hyperloop might do for world transport. It's, uh, some of the presentations we saw described it as an evolutionary step, um, and it was quite hard at times to to forget about traditional transport models and to forget about the traditional station model and think, well, actually, if you're traveling at the speed of sound, uh, what are the benefits? Um, and where are the key barriers to making that a really worthwhile experience? Um, discussing the notion of uh, the passenger's experience, which is really for the future, um, the idea that it has to be a door-to-door -door service. And if it really is a door-to-door -door service, what is the role of the station or the hub? Because it may be that uh, uh, the station itself can create blockage to the overall experience. If you imagine that if you got to a situation where you're going from your front door to the station it takes you longer than going, say, from London to New York, then you, we also need to review that part of the journey. Um, there was discussion about how we might come compare it with uh, airport systems, and we've all experienced the length of time it get, takes to get through check-in and onto your flight, uh, which is all about safety and security and um, revenue protection as well, of course. So we, we think, well, is the station the right place to do that? Should you have multiple points where you can collect people um, and, and so forth? I was particularly interested to see if we could learn from this experience and see how we can perhaps apply it to, to the stations that we're working on in the UK and, and um, elsewhere, and whether it's that kind of whole passenger journey experience and actually opening stations up as, as less of a building and more of an open um, access to a, a new network. Other kind of curiosities came about, which were you know, 70, 70 miles across um, UAE. Is that really long enough to justify accelerating to the speed of sound and then having to deaccelerate. And we figured that by the time you've actually got to the speed of sound, you'd probably have to immediately start to deaccelerate in order that the G-force didn't um, smother you on the back of the capsule. Um, and one of the huge benefits of having a vacuum at ground level was that the energy source can be at ground level. And this means that actually the power system can be part of the tube and the capsule itself becomes super lightweight. And that enables you to think about a different way of carrying a capsule around, not just within a tube, but perhaps all the way to someone's front door. I'm not going to take much more time because I'm keen to hear from the um, Mobius and the, and the other finalists, um, and I'm sure you are too. But from our perspective, it was a truly incredible experience to, to be part of um, watching the submissions, watching the presentations, and being part of the discussion of what we all actually now really genuinely beginning to believe will be um, a transport model for the future. Um, and if, if Dubai manages to prototype it and test it, uh, we should be hugely grateful for them because they'll have to make all the mistakes before the rest of us can get an opportunity to um, then take advantage of, of the effort that they've put into to testing the, the new ideas through. So I'm going to hand back to Ike, and I'm actually going to flash through a whole load of unless somebody can do that automatically for me, um, because I think we <laughs> to hear from the submissions um, in order to move that uh, move the discussion on. Thank you, Ike. Great, well, thank you very much. Uh, great. Uh,
Okay, so hi everybody. Um, I will start uh, just with a quick presentation on who we are. Um, basically, we are uh, Sistra, which is a French company specialized in public transportation. We are a multidisciplinary group, and uh, we partnered for this uh, contest with uh, MAP3, which is a structural uh, consultant. Um, there was our team was about uh, 30 people, which were not all working all of the time. We uh, intervened different people at different moments, uh, depending on the on the needs of what we were designing at some point or the other of the of the contest. But this allowed us to have a continuity through the 24 to the eight, 48 hours. So, um, how we saw the 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 contest itself, it's a little bit how we. Uh, tackle all of our projects. First of all, it was uh, the idea of having a collaborative and BIM integrated methodology. Um, we're not familiar with uh, the Adoodle platform, but that was a, quite of a challenge for us, but it was it was fun and it was interesting. Um, we're, the incorporation of hyperloop specificities, of course, was very important because that's the, what the whole point was about. And it, it made us question a lot of things on how we normally uh, conceive stations because everything was different this time. And everything, it, it pushes us to, to think out of the box and uh, just get all our, our, our things, uh, like our normal way of thinking out of uh, how we who did it normally. Um, we wanted to develop the subjects within our expertise, so we treat the system as a whole. Uh, I think this is one of the interesting things we did is we just we didn't just treat it from an architectural point of view, but we integrated uh, specialists from different uh, uh, from different uh, departments, and we had a uh, urban integration, uh, pedestrian flow, station operations, track alignment, and system operations. We tried to treat all of the requirements. Um, which were quite ex uh, extensive, actually. Uh, we wanted to deliver a sustainable design, which was one of the, of the requirements as well. And of course, uh, since it's a very futurist uh, project, we wanted to design a landmark architecture which would make a statement. So um, on how we worked uh, was uh, we, 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 first of all, we put some BIM objectives, which was having a maturity level of two. And we established a collaborative design process using a site. Um, we used a different BIM model for every field, and then we put it together in federated models. Uh, all of the deliverables were made uh, through BIM, and we all made all visualizations and simulations of design through the use of this, uh, of, of this um Instrument. So we had the, the team uh, organized around the team leader and a BIM um, manager. And then we have a team leader for each discipline, which was basically MEP, architecture, and construction and, and structure. And we have some uh, people helping with uh, images, videos, and stuff like that. Um, for the models, what we did is we basically worked with uh, Revit at the base, and uh, we did a different model for each discipline. Then uh, we used Nevis Works to do a little bit of uh, collaboration and synthesis and check off if there were clashes. And to put all that together, we used uh, InfraWorks to have the three stations and the line uh, as well. Uh, of course, there are all more specific uh, uh, tools that were used uh, other than Revit for each uh, for each uh, discipline. Um, how we worked uh, with the site platform is we really tried to use it as much as possible, and we uploaded every time there was an update on each model uh, to for the other coordinators and the main manager to see. We made a validation, and then we 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 went to the next step of the design. Um, as you can see, we used uh, a lot of different tools. Basically, Revit was the the base of it, but we used. Um, BIM in one click, which is a tool that we have uh, created inside the uh, Sistra uh, for the for the linear uh, design of the viaduct. We used robot for the structure and a lot of other tools for MEP as well. Um, so if we go to the design itself, we we the first thing we we treated was the alignment, which basically. Uh, we defined a corridor which was uh, elevated uh, throughout the, the 
the most part of it, but there was an underground part in uh, Dubai internet, uh, to go through the city center because there's, uh, it's too dense. So, so we didn't want to, to, to interrupt the city with an elevated section and also to go through the mountains uh, arriving to Fujairah. Um, we did a, we treated every element of the infrastructure. So we treated the, a tunnel in which you have the four different tubes and a viaduct with uh, the, the four tubes as well for, for the elevated part in which we can uh, support the solar panels. And um, we, uh, I'm going quite fast through all of that because there's a lot of uh, information, but I'm trying to, to give you a, a an overview of everything that we did. Uh, so there's a other thing that we do to prior to starting on the stations itself. It's a treating station demand and capacity because we didn't have a real information about that. So we just tried to 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 get information from the internet and see how much people would be actually using the system and how the stations would be different one from each other uh, following that. And we actually found that Dubai International and Agmaktoum would be more or less the same and Fujairah would have a little bit uh, less uh, less passengers. Um, we also did some urban insertion, which was important because all of the stations were near the, the airports, but were not close to it. So we needed to create a feeder system and we needed to, to think on how this feeder system will would would be arriving to the station. And that was kind of important on the functionality of the station itself. Um, then something that uh, was important for us was also how we were going to move the, the pods around in stations. And this is a very specific problem in the Hyperloop because uh, you cannot uh, turn around the, the, the pod, the, the motor is only on one side of the of the pod and well you need to, to take some radio to, to, to move around. So we tried to get rid of that uh, using um, actually a, a robot which already exists not at the side of the pod but already exists for other systems. So we said when the pod arrives to the station we put it on this uh, thing that can move on every direction and then we are free to, to, to move however we can and in, in this way we can optimize the, the size of the station. Then as for stations itself, we thought it was important to segregate the, the flows and this was what uh, structured were the, the way the, the stations were going to, to, to function. So we have a, a level which is the platform level in which uh, you have several platforms um, this is because the, the pods are actually arriving faster than the time in which you can uh, have people going down from the pods and going up. So we, you need to have more platforms than tubes. And the idea is you have several platforms and then people can arrive to, to the platform they, they've chosen. And you have platforms for, for people boarding and for people arriving. And then this, uh, you, you can go to a different level where people going out of the pods can just go out of the station. And people going in, it's a little bit different because there was a, uh, a demand for having uh, control uh, of the tickets and security. So it works a little bit like an airport. So you have a, a counter where you check in and then you have a, a security point and you have a, a waiting area where you can wait to, to go to the preferred platform and then you go to, to your platform. Um, we did the same thing with the freight. Uh, in a different level, but the idea is you have the pods on one side, then you have a, a zone where the 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 um, the the the, lo the the trucks are loading and unloading, and between the both of them, it's a uh, it's um, uh, handled by robots as well, which is already done in 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 things like uh, uh, other types of uh, of hubs or for freight. Um, we did a dynamic simulation to make sure that the sizing we're doing was okay. Uh, and as you can see, it were quite comfortable. So conclusion was that maybe we could optimize this uh, uh, further if we were going to continue the study of, of, of this station. 
Uh, and basically, the architecture we tried to do was very simple, uh, very geometrical form, just following the functionality of the station. And we treated the, the roof in a, in a very curved, very organic way uh, with a, a lot of solar panels because one of the ideas is to have an independent station So, uh, from an energetic point of view. Um, if we go to the intermediate station, it's the same idea, only this time you don't have a loop to go around. It's uh, you actually the, the tracks, if we may call them like that, just go through the station and continue on the other side. But it's the same, uh, it's the same mentality, the same functionality principles. Um, in in this station as well, we treated uh, the, the the roof as an architectural uh, element. Uh, basically, because that's all that you see, because the station it's a little bit, um, it's not underground, but the level, it's uh, you have a lot of roads going around, so you don't really see the station much. And um, just to, to speak quickly how we worked on the structure, we developed uh, the, the, um, the structure itself with um, Dynamo, which is a plugin for Revit, and then we calculated it in, in robot to make sure that it was all working out. We did that for, for both of the stations and from the MEP studies, we did photovoltaic system studies which showed us, as you can see in the first uh, image, uh, where we were uh, getting the most solar activity which we could uh, use. We also did some HVAC uh, simulations and we find out that uh, during the winter we can actually use natural ventilation to, to keep the, the station at a good temperature. And we did some smoke management uh, simulations as well. Um, basically, that's, uh, that's it. So it's a very quick overview about it. but. Uh, Thank you, Ike. Good morning. So, Bimman Limited, just to introduce our team, is an international team of individuals located in the UK, Belgium, Japan, Dominican Republic, and Brazil. We're led by a desire to create innovative architecture within a collaborative BIM workflow, and the lead architect is Ruben Hernandez Fontana. As I said, my name is Martin Horn, and I was the team leader for this challenge. We took the award for the best use of multidisciplinary BIM and the use of interoperability. And importantly to us, the major disciplines within the team are free to use a different primary software within their specialist fields, uh, which included architecture, structural design and analysis, environmental analysis, and pedestrian flow analysis. And we exchange our models using IFC. As you know, this was a 48-hour competition, and so this presentation, uh, I've tried to set this in the context of those 48 hours. So for the first step, we imported the three distinct IFC site models provided as part of the brief. Uh, each site was correctly georeferenced using real-world latitude and longitudinal coordinates. And this was critical in being able to establish the important requirement of the brief, um, namely the design of the track route between the three main terminals. Our team's response to the brief sets out to provide not only an urban solution, but one that promotes sustainability 
and an airflow analysis of the site using Flow Designer was instrumental at this stage to simulate wind patterns over the localized site and existing buildings using weather data. The project started, uh, the intent developed from four principles, efficiency, sustainability, innovation, and the fact that it was cost aware. In our proposal, the track takes the shortest and most direct route, ensuring the minimum travel time without interfering with the existing airports and other infrastructure. Placing the terminals at the point where the Hyperloop needs to change direction minimizes the travel time and creates a more user-friendly experience given the speeds involved. So we propose three terminals and a loop which connects them in a parallel system without any tangling and allows the entire journey of 258 kilometers to be undertaken in 11 minutes and 20 seconds. You'll see here the curved fit footprint of the buildings not only demonstrates their relationship to the loop, um, but it's also a geometry that comes as a result of detailed environmental uh, airflow analysis, which I'll cover shortly. And here we can see uh, a slide showing the development of massing models uh, which we did as early as possible, and this allowed other members of the team to get involved and provide their input really from the get-go. And here we see the massing in space models for um, Dubai Terminal. And we can see here that that was taken uh, in early on by our, envir our environmental and airflow analysis colleagues. From the outset, it was, it was our aim to develop a building which would mitigate the high turbulences evident on the downward side of the building and the site and to minimize the rapid increase in, in wind velocity near the building edge. Our team members from the University of Tokyo uh, provided their flow analysis feedback of the initial massing studies. So here we can see an overview of the, the site for the Dubai terminal and then at the either end of the, the loop, uh, a close-up here showing a distinctive offset curved footprint of both the arrival and departure terminals. Um, they provided a good wind analysis pattern creating calm sheltered zones on its downward side, which is where we situated the, the parks and further calming of the wind speed experienced in the park areas could be achieved by placing trees in front and upwind of the buildings. So moving through to the next 12 hours, we started to add solar and shadow studies into the mix with the various terminals and then also began to generate uh, design intent perspectives. From the architectural side, most of this was handled within Vectorworks Architect and its inbuilt rendering system Renderworks, and in parallel we had members working on the design of the Hyperloop capsule, the tube in which it travels, and its integration with the station terminals. So moving through into, into day two, we can see examples of the design through collaboration, um, specifically model checking and clashing vo avoidance. Here going from architect through to the Libri model checker. And here we can see the space tool through Vectorworks Architect um, being used and taken through again into Celebri model checker, uh, model checker to create an immediate evaluation of the areas according to the brief and also the occupancy rate. So uh, we're now up to a day and a half, so we're into the final quarter of the 48 hours. And to expand our design intent a little further, uh, each terminal was really conceived as an oasis, as a, a form giver 
for places of interchange. So that includes services, food, stores, businesses, parking and security. Uh, so working as a node, the project really is all surrounded by soft and green spaces, as we can see here with Terminal 1 and here with Terminal 2 and here with Terminal 3. The architecture also functions as an open space in general terms. So as an example of this, the air circulates as a conveyor extracting hot air through big holes which penetrate the building roofs, effectively acting as ventilation chimneys. Um, with 12 hours of, of sunlight, photovoltaic panels are also placed across the roof. So here we see some screenshots of the same ventilation chimneys seen from within the terminal spaces um, and here taken by our model validation team who are working with Salibri Model Checker. Quick mention um, for the use of A-Site, which as Nathan, Nathan mentioned, um, was used by all the teams and no different with our team as a common data environment to uplaid, upload, uh, preview and distribute the data. I talked before about the, the, the trees being sort of planted to dampen the, the wind velocity. So in terms of landscaping, as uh, the palm tree is the species best adapted to the weather. We propose to make a, a phoenix palm tree forest arranged in a triangular matrix really to provide as much shade as possible. Pedestrian flow analysis was also undertaken using the Vectorworks plugin SimTread and here we were able to confirm that the peak customer flow as specified the, with the brief could be achieved. Um, this was uh, presented using several real-time animations to demonstrate that the architectural layout presented no crunch points or delays to the movement of people, and either through the terminals or when embarking or disembarking the Hyperloop trains themselves. In a case of emergency, the platform can hold 900 um, pedestrians, uh, reaching peak time uh, levels of 840 customers per hour and six Hyperloop capsules every five minutes. Similarly, a collaborative appro uh, process took place for the Hyperloop track system, which was elevated on concrete pylons. And here again, designed in Vectorworks Architect and then analyzed structurally uh, via SEA engineering um, solution by Rodrigo uh, Cuto, one of our team members. Uh, again, all through IFC files, and they were also then taken into Synchro 4D software where the, the fourth dimension of time was added to create phase construction schedule worksheets. So I've already talked about the uh, another example of parallel working with the, the tube, and I hear the architect Jonathan Rees from J JRA and also Gregory Fortune from the Palace, the Palace of Westminster, um, who are members on our team, were able to create a series of proposals for both the track routes and the design of the Hyperloop train. The design re response really was to explore the modelling of a typical section of the Hyperloop that was suitable for the urban environment above ground, um, modelling of the four passenger and freight pods and you can see here that they were encased uh, within the structural tube to establish the form and size of the Hyperloop. Uh, and really here then uh, just sort of to mention in terms of some of the technology, um, here Jonathan used some of the parametric surface array uh, capabilities within Vectorworks to model the complex facade which he based on uh, sort of Arabic uh, mosaic patterns and here we can see uh, that tube within the, um, how that behaves within the urban environment. So we're really now into the, the final stage. And in this cutaway we can see the concept of the ventilation voids penetrating those in, internal spaces that I talked about earlier. And here then working up sections and elevations direct, that taken directly from the uh, model. And as I said, any updates really here can be, uh, up, any updates to the model can be automatically reflected in those, in those views. A brief mention about the facade that we proposed uh, 
within the building. So um, here we were looking at natural ventilation as much as possible. And for the wraparound facade, the perforated modular panels allow for natural ventilation whilst blocking 70% of the sun's radiation and allowing natural dappled light to enter the, into the space. Last few slides. To understand the overall project, we can see in this single image really the concept of the connected route, the terminals, the loop, um, and here including the arrival and departure platforms, the palm tree forest that I talked about, photo rotate roofs, grey water recycling system, and the concept of the terminal oasis um, seen within the within the chimneys. To finish very quickly with three perspectives. Uh, here we can see including the, the gill-like arrangement of the facade, the proposal placed within the urban context here, and you can see the concept of the, of the forest there, and a higher camera, seeing the chimneys acting as breathing holes within the roof. That's really all I've got time for, and I hope that concludes my presentation, so I hope you found that brief run-through informative. Back to you, Ike. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Nathan. Cheers. Um, thank you. Um, obviously, thanks to all our speakers um, for those um, really insightful um, presentations. So hopefully, people have got a flavour of what was involved in this competition, how each designer um, responded to it. Um, right. As promised, we've got um, only probably only a couple of minutes to address some questions. Thanks for all those that have been sent through. Um, Paul has hopefully offered to um, uh, um, address one of the questions. I think it's the one um, from Zaid Newman, which um, talks about when it says, while it's not a concern for non-life shipment in the freight system, is, are there any medical um, issues or examinations that have been done on the effect of hyperspeed transport on humans? So, um, Paul, Thank you, Ike. Yes, you. I'm not sure I can answer the question directly because I'm sure there's an awful lot of research being done into how hyperloop will affect humans. But I think I just wanted to highlight that you've um, raised the question of freight, which I think um, in response to some of the other questions, the viability of future hyperloop systems may very well depend significantly on freight. And that then kind of raises a, a curious question to me because it's almost like humans become part of that freight transportation system. Um, and how, com, coming from that also is, is the energy required to, to carry freight and humans at such vast speeds. And the, the thinking, um, just reflecting on some of the discussions we had with Colin Reese, who was a human experiences uh, operations manager from Hyperloop One, in that there's an argument that says that if you bring um, transport down to ground level, and the, as I said earlier, the capsule itself doesn't have to carry the fuel because the fuel is actually connected to the ground and you can have solar panel systems or other forms of energy actually planted on the ground feeding into the tube, which is the, is the motorized mechanism, then it must use much less energy to carry a lightweight tube through a vacuum than it does, for example, to, to lift an aeroplane up into the sky and carry it across the Atlantic. So, so that's just the concept. The detail I'm not familiar with, but I'm fascinated by that concept that if you think it through, seems to, to demonstrate that, that this system could be viable. One last little point which hasn't been mentioned is the question I think that we all ask ourselves about hubs and stations and such like is how can we also monetize passengers' experience in terms of retail delivery, in terms of advertising and such like. And I think we all need to give further thought to that because if you're not um, allowing the passenger to dwell or stop for any great period of time, you don't want them to go shopping, you want them to get as quickly from the door to door as humanly possible, then we need to think about other ways of, of um, capturing that opportunity as well. So I'll hand back to Ike on that. Great. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for that. Sorry, Kristen. Um, right. We literally have a um, closing second. So what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to present a question to Perla and Martin, actually, um, which hopefully can encapsulate a lot of what they talked about. Um, obviously, obviously, it's clearly revolutionary technology. If you were to maybe identify one key issue, one key area where BIM and the ASAP platform offered the most advantage to what you were doing, what would you say, um, what would you say that would have been? Um, from our point of view, I think uh, BIM was a key instrument to be able to, to do a lot of this work in such a short period of time because it allows for to, to do a synchronization of everybody at the same point and so 
synthesis is done almost automatically. So. Okay, great. Thank you, Perla. Martin, quickly, just from you? Just uh, I'd, I'd echo that 100%. It, it allows parallel working to a much greater extent than we've been able to do in the past. Okay, fantastic. Brilliant. Okay, um, I think that's just about the close of the webinar. Um, thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Just to remind you that the um, slides will be available on demand from the building website um, from Monday. So I'd like to conclude by thanking all our speakers and presentation. I hope we can all agree it's a fascinating subject, a revolutionary subject, which could change the way we all live in the future. Um, thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your days and the weekend. Thank you. Goodbye.